Joining me on the session are two panelists. Uh, Kevin Isaacs, he's the VP of the SBC product line at Sonus Networks, and Simon Dredge, who is Director of Technical Marketing at Metaswitch. Um, both Kevin and Simon will be giving brief presentations, after which we'll open it up to uh, discussion uh, and Q&A. Um, Kevin will be presenting first, but before he gets started, let me tell you a bit more about him. Uh, Kevin is VP uh, uh, of, uh, and Chief Development Officer at Sonus. Uh, previously, he was an engineer for Wang Global. Uh, in addition to designing and architecting VoIP products, uh, Kevin has vast experience in UC. Uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Paula. Let me you Hopefully everybody can hear me. Thanks. So first of all, who is Sonus? Has anybody in the room heard of Sonus? I think before I... Oh, good. We've got a couple of hands in the front there. Of course, the co our competitors should. That's a, always a good thing. <laughs> so ultimately, you know, Sonus is a company that's a, a long history in the carrier space. So obviously, software telco being the, the latest big thing, NFE being the latest big thing. You know, we've got a long history, VoIP gateways, and now mostly session border controllers. So we're the fastest growing vendor in SPCs. So we've been constantly growing market share, even though the market's actually been diving off. <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking predominantly about NFE, since obviously we're at NFE show. And you know, we believe at Sonus NFE really is the leader as far as, if you look at NFE and SDN, NFE really is the emerging technology that's going to go first. Right? SDN, there's a lot of hesitation. A lot of uncertainty, how do I use it, how's it going to plug in, whereas NFV makes a lot more sense. Why? Because you basically you run it on commercial off-the-shelf hardware, and you're finally able to take a lot of the networking functions and put them on standard COTS hardware. So you no longer need big, high-power devices, routers, ASICs. Now you can actually run it on standard COTS hardware and get the amount you need. And the big advantage, of course, is the agility and scalability. So you have the ability to now turn up different VMs and be able to turn up different functions very quickly and very easily. So why are we interested in NFE? You know, we're traditionally a big iron hardware manufacturer. So you know, a lot of people will go, well, you know, you're eating your own young if you're going to be going into the NFE space because you know, you're not going to be able to charge for the big iron. The reality is, we want to be out of the hardware business, right? That's, if you look at it from a long-term perspective, hardware does just really take up space, and now commercial off-the-shelf hardware can actually get you to the point that you could do with custom hardware. It can't get you all the way there yet. We're not all the way, right? If you want to do 10 gig line rate, very high, you still need custom hardware. You still need dedicated network processors, DSPs, all those things. But if you want to do gigabit rates, you can now do that with software. So why have hardware when you can do it in a pure software solution? So we've basically you know, taken, our software, taken our actual full function software and from our SPC, our carrier grade 5200 device, we've taken it and we've actually ported it over. And because we have all the intellectual property around all the different pieces, we've taken it over and ported it to run on a VM. So we have all the pieces running on a VM and that then comes out and actually just virtualizes an SPC. This product's going to be GA next month. And we've come at it in the market basically as the first fully supported software SPC. So it has no limitations. We don't say, oh, you can't use it past 250 sessions or anything like that. It is a full like-for-like -like replacement, and uh, it will support all the features that the current uh, SPC has. All right? And as I said, right, I already summed this up. So if you look at once you now actually done the initial NFE rollout, you know, how are you going to break it up? Because if you look at what is in an SPC, you know, what system water controller sitting at the edge, you've got the signaling side, and then you've got the media plane. So the signaling side is responsible for all the different SIP pieces and doing interworking, normalization, making it all work. And then the media plane is responsible for either moving the packets around or doing things like transcoding and we're making them work in between. You can now basically separate those two out. So you've actually got 
the switching and security can be sitting either on you know, basically an open source hardware or you can actually you know, an SDN router and then this is the kind of thing that would actually work in the DSPs. So you're probably asking the question, well I came to the session <coughs> and to find out about is open source relevant and he hasn't mentioned open source yet. So that was the, the brief introduction. Now open source adds an interesting angle to NFV. Right? There's a belief that you, know, you could basically with open daylights and other frameworks, you could go out and actually build your own SPC that does everything just with the framework. Right? That's not true. It takes a long time to get it to be able to do all the intrusion, be able to do all the deflection that a, that a typical session border controller can do, the inner working, all those pieces. But we do believe that open source software really does provide a lot of the fabric you need to be able to make it all work. Right? A combination of open source software with closed source software, like software from ourselves, allows you to complete the solution. Right? So we only have part of it. Right? We don't provide the open flow controller pieces if you're running with SDN, if you want to use you know, open vSwitch or something like that. We don't provide routers. We don't provide all those other pieces. So with open source, you can actually patch it all together. But it is obviously important that you choose the right components because open source also has the wonderful support that comes with free software. Right? You get what you pay for, ultimately. So if you're willing to invest your own resources to do it, you can actually complete the network and your deployment very well. Right? Obviously, things like open daylight, giving you all the rest of management pieces. You can add on the routers with things like uh, open vSwitch. And you can plug that all into SDN using it for controllers. So you can, great way of completing the solution with, with open source, but you do also need additional closed source pieces in there to make the whole thing work. So if you look at the big picture on how everything scales out, you know, we can actually take our SPC that I mentioned that we virtualized, and we can stack it up as separate integrated SPCs, one on top of each other. And this is something that's been quite interesting to me, especially, to see that people are actually happy to support this in a way that you're separately configuring these. Why? Because they can actually use these one, each one for a different customer. So you can have different certs and all the other pieces on there, right? Or you can break it up in a way where you have the control plane. So this is the signaling side, and it's decomposed, and it talks over to an actual a DSP farm that's responsible for doing all the transcoding side. Right? You all can also have the ability where So I'm not here. <laughs> Strange. Guess don't get any props anymore. Pardon the technical interlude. Let's try, let's try restarting the deck. Okay. So we can actually scale out the different parts of it independently. So instead of just taking out the DSPs like I've shown on the right, you can actually now also have the signaling broken out, and then the switching side. So responsible for taking the different flows, opening the ports, all those are separate pieces, broken into different pieces. And then lastly, you could actually replace that with something like a, an open source switch. So there's a lot of ways you can fit and plug open source into it. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Dredge. Nice. Thank you, Kevin. So appreciate that. Um, Boom. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure, man. All right. Um, OK, so I'm going to open this up by shouting, apparently, a little bit first, and um, then toning my voice down a little bit, and then answering the question that you've all been asking, it, which is, K 
can telcos actually deliver a service using open source. And we at Metaswitch believe, and the community we have been working with in the last uh, sort of six months or so, uh, believe that absolutely, with the help of uh, Rosie the Riveter here, the iconic World War II icon, that yes, we can. In fact, it's been done. Um, uh, indeed, one of our own business units actually competes against one of the, peop uh, one of the uh, areas that's being done, uh, the likes of Asterix and, and, and FreeSwitch in the, uh, in the VoIP switching domain. So uh, we know very well of carriers who believe that uh, they can deliver uh, services of, of, uh, of open source uh, today, and uh, we are extending that uh, as MetaSwitch. And the question is, of course, can it be built uh, both scalable and resilient? And the answer, again, is yes. Um, now, we do believe that there is some innovation required in the area of five nines, and I won't go into the whole sort of five nines, four nines sort of argument, resiliency uh, discussions that we, we had earlier. Uh, but again, you know what I mean when I say sort of in the area of five nines, resiliency, uh, robustness, and, and such like, we do believe it can be done. But there's probably some areas of innovation required to make that happen. Um, I won't dwell on this slide either, primarily because I obviously stole it from the keynote presentation today. Um, uh, but, of course, without going in, into, the, into the details here, we believe by building services on, on open source, we are generally standing on the shoulders of, of, of giants here. Uh, obviously, these guys you see uh, have done it. That's how they deliver the multitude of the, their services. They do it via collaborative efforts. Um, they build on each other's uh, achievements, and for the most part, maybe Apple aside, I don't know, uh, they actually give back to the community once they've innovated. So uh, again, they, uh, every, every time a, uh, a new company comes out, delivering a new service, new feature, a new function, uh, they're actually doing it on, based on the efforts of, of, of others in the larger uh, community. So uh, it's, it's been done today uh, in these areas. So the question is, of course, what are the, uh, the trade-offs to, uh, to delivering an open source service uh, versus delivering a service as has been classically delivered today? Now, I hate to use the Metaswitch uh, VP of Sales uh, as, a, uh, as a poster child for, uh, uh, for the telco uh, vendor way of the, doing things, but uh, I think it makes the point right here. Uh, of course, you know, we all know the, uh, uh, the, the issues, the challenges of the delivering uh, a service in the way that it's done today. Um, products and solutions that are delivered in a proprietary nature are typically expensive to acquire. Uh, the vendor controls everything, right? The roadmap, how fast things are developed, and they typically lock you in or lock the telco in uh, to, uh, to, to their solution, and not just for a single element, sometimes for a complete solution as well. Often custom hardware. Uh, the good side for a telco, of course, is that there's no development effort. Right? They don't do anything, they just sit back, relax, cut the checks, and the uh, vendor rolls in the product uh, on, their, on their doorstep. Um, of course, because the vendor does control the product, it is though expensive to maintain. From an open source perspective, from the carrier's perspective, you know, the beauty is, of course, it's free, right? You know, absolutely, totally free. Um, if the telco develops the features or subcontracts to, uh, to a third party to develop the features, of course, they can have ultimate control of the roadmap. They can control when new features are, uh, are developed at, uh, as and when they require. Lots of freedom there. Uh, open source, of course, developed for, for commercial off-the-shelf hardware. Um, again, they might have to put a little bit more effort than they had done in the past in terms of the development to get that freedom to de deliver the features as and when they want. Uh, but of course, that's a, uh, you, you have to weigh up the, uh, the pros and cons there. Um, and the last thing, of course, is that something's been talked about uh, uh, quite a bit, obviously. Uh, the open source components are, are, are developed with uh, DevOps, DevOps methods rather than the, uh, uh, the, the, the current mechanisms for delivering a, uh, a component. Right. So, beautiful. Here we go. It's gone dark. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'll jump up there. Brett, fix the PC and it's already done. All right. So, um, so what does this mean? What did MetaSwitch do uh, in terms of delivering products with open source? Well, we've actually done it. Um, about, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we started developing a, uh, uh, an, an IMS core. I've discussed this before on the, uh, on the panel this morning. Um, when we actually started developing it, in all fairness, we had no 
view of actually developing it to be open source. Uh, however, uh, what we did know is that when we started developing um, this, uh, this IMS core, we know we had to do it in a completely different way than, uh, than, than software has been developed in the past. Okay, so we, we know we have to use these dev DevOps, met DevOps methods, agile development, short sprint, highly collaborative. All right? So uh, we knew we had to use web methods uh, and we had to develop at web speed and with web scale. Okay, so off we went. Uh, and again, with that MO, we eventually uh, delivered a, uh, a, a, an IMS core component that was indeed uh, highly scalable uh, based on the way it was built and of highly portable as well. It's designed for the cloud and we've tested it uh, in VMware OpenStack uh, and Windows Azure environments and with those uh, shim layers as well. So having run this up and spun this up in Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud uh, and run the numbers based on uh, EC2, uh, we've also discovered that we can deliver an IMS core very cheaply uh, using um, uh, this, uh, this using Project Clearwater. So, if we weigh it up against the sort of current IMS core uh, deployments, sort of uh, vendor-based IMS core uh, uh, deployments, you know, we can see those uh, ranging anywhere between five and ten dollars per subscriber. With Project Clearwater, as it's open source, it's free, you can actually, um, uh, uh, actually deliver a service for less than uh, two cents per subscriber per year. So uh, we delivered, uh, after developing uh, uh, the core of uh, Project Clearwater, uh, as is now, we decided to release it to the open source community, available for, uh, for download. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was the first uh, virtual network function uh, actually chosen to be run up or spun up in the cloud NFV uh, consortium uh, as, a, as, as a proof of concept for, for NFV. So why did we decide to open source it? Well, quite honestly, when we were uh, going through the development, we took a, look, uh, took a step back and we took a look at all the individual pieces of open source that we have used or used in Project Clearwater to date. As you can see, we come up with this number, about 70 of them. So much like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the giants that I showed on the, on the previous slide here, we made that conscious effort to say, you know what? In order to deliver this uh, highly scalable uh, uh, IMS core, we've used all this community code. You know what, guys? It's only fair that we give it back to the community. And that's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what we did, again, a few months ago when we released it as, a, uh, as an open source project to the community. So obviously, uh, uh, outside the, uh, uh, the, the availability to, to use and reuse these common components in order to, to deliver a new product uh, quickly and efficiently, there's one other thing that, uh, that uh, open source gives you. And um, that's actually highlighted in the, uh, in the last two, uh, one of the last two uh, cells right there. Uh, under the Clearwater infrastructure. Um, I've highlighted Memcache and, and Infinished Span. And in actual fact, what those two components are, are two different ways to deliver uh, a, a fast uh, cluster redundant and, uh, uh, and, and fast long-lived SIP storage. Right? So what we was doing is we was going through these sprints, and our sprints in our agile development are two weeks. So Think about it, every two weeks we're releasing a new uh, a piece of code uh, for, for Clearwater. So very, very short sprint, sprints. Um, we started off using Memcache to fulfill this requirement. And about two sprints down the, uh, down the road with, with Memcache, we said, you know what? We think we can do this better with InfiniSpan. So InfiniSpan, if, uh, if you look at the arguments, InfiniSpan should be better at delivering this sort of uh, uh, state maintenance. What we found very quickly was in actual fact it wasn't. So we implemented with, uh, InfiniSpan, very quickly found uh, when we implemented it that it actually wasn't better th than Memcached. Uh, so what we did in the following sprint is go, went back to Memcached and instead of relying on InfiniSpan's elastic scalability, we decided to just build it ourselves on top of Memcached. So as the diagram suggests there and the, uh, the, uh, the title suggests there, you know what, the great thing about the, uh, the, with the open source, there's no emotional attachments. There's no guy, uh, employee sitting in the corner of the room cutting code for, 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 for six months that he's really uh, tied to and the boss just has to say, you know what, he spent a lot of time doing this. Let's make him happy and use it even though it's not that good. All right? You don't have that problem with open source. There's no emotional attachment right there. So last thing, of course, with open source, you can nurture the community. And uh, obviously, we've, uh, we've opened up a clear water on GitHub. And uh, of course, anybody can actually uh, check out that, uh, that, that code, uh, download it, 
um, uh, branch it, send in pull requests, uh, and obviously ultimately fork it if they if they want to as well. So it's a development, it's a community effort, uh, and again you can uh, you can see that the community is at work with Project Clearwater. And of course, as a community effort, you have to have the the, the blogs by the leading uh, engineers there, and obviously there's also the uh, the message boards there as well that uh, that they can leverage. All right, so what do we do with Clearwater? Uh, we certainly discussed this on, the, on this morning's panel a little bit. So with, uh, with Clearwater, obviously, as part of an NFV environment, uh, we actually know that Clearwater is built on different service components, a load balancer, a, uh, a, an ICSCF, an SCSCF, an HSS shim. Uh, so these are individual uh, virtual network function components, and uh, each of them has, a, has their own descriptor. What we do in classic uh, NFV parlance is that we build these uh, into a service graph. The service graph obviously defines how those uh, individual virtual network uh, function components actually work together. We wrap a, uh, an XML descriptor, a VNFD, uh, around that service graph, and then that service graph ultimately, with the, uh, with the descriptor, becomes the virtual network function, the package, if you like. So there's the package at the bottom, and the package is what we ultimately want, the IMS core. We then can instantiate that within a, uh, a something like Cloud NFE's uh, in environment. Uh, that's this their proof of concept environment, and this is basically what it looks like. Again, the environment is built up of uh, a number of known vendors in the, who have specialties in, in their individual spaces, anywhere from the data plane accelerators through the DPI technology through the orchestration. All right, so again, again, you can see why uh, uh, they chose um, uh, Project Clearwater as one of the first uh, virtualized network functions. So we slide into that, uh, that environment, and again, uh, down the road, we're then instantiated as part of a, uh, a service function chain. So uh, you can see there, second one down, there's a bunch of examples of a service function chain. You can see there you know, uh, the uh, RIMS offering uh, clearly in play as, uh, as part of a, a Volti or RCS MM MMTEL service along with a, uh, SBC and the PCSCF. All right, so that's the sort of um, virtualized network function component through to uh, service function chain uh, evolution right there. All right, so I said I'd hit this uh, up a bit later about the resiliency and redundancy. Here's some tests that we actually run with uh, Project Clearwater. Uh, this is actually running in uh, Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud uh, environment. And what we actually did, we, again, quick test, a bit crude maybe, uh, but again, show how the, we can provide some redundancy just within a public cloud environment to give you an idea of how you can dramatically improve that within a private cloud environment. So in this example here, we have, uh, we have uh, two instances of, um, actually one instance is split geographically between, uh, between DC and Ireland. Uh, and what you'll see here is that uh, in, the, in Europe, uh, all, the, uh, all the people registering to, uh, to Clearwater from the uh, European region register that node, North America at the bottom there, and it'll be registering from North, in from North America coming to, the, uh, coming to Washington, D.C. We literally pulled the plug, essentially, as, you, as, you, as much as you can do, uh, on, the, uh, on the European node, and you can see there a failure, and less than two minutes later, you see North America picking up and taking all the traffic that would typically be going to that European node. So another view of that. Uh, again, this is when the uh, the point where the uh, we, where we pulled the plug on the uh, uh, on the European instance, and again, node fails. We get uh, uh, successful calls. Number of successful calls obviously goes down uh, for uh, less than one twenty seconds, and then obviously the calls start picking up as uh, as North America takes over. All right, so two minutes outage, a little bit under maybe, uh, but as you can see, this is a a, a public cloud environment. You can see. With a, with a bit of tweaking how we can easily get those numbers way down in a private cloud environment where you have uh, more control. Another view of uh, elastic scalability here, again, just, just some early tests. Uh, graph showing here how, uh, look particularly at the, uh, uh, the red line here, when CPU utilization had a certain, uh, certain point, we automatically started spinning up new instances, new CPU instances, to uh, obviously increase the capacity. And then further down the graph there, the uh, blue and the uh, yellow lines, what you see there, when we started tweaking up the number of calls, you can see that the, uh, the CPU scaled elastically uh, with the number of call requests coming in. So again, another, another, another view of how uh, Project Clearwater's been testing the real environment that is EC2. With that, I'll hand over to Paula, because I've probably spoken way too long. You're right. actually just right on time. All right. um, did anybody in the audience have any questions?
Uh, could you please address how you feel that if all vendors, uh, for instance, that make SBCs all started using the same open source, how, how would they provide differentiation? How would they get a competitive edge um, in that type of environment? Well, we didn't necessarily say where all vendors would use the same open source, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense that everybody use the same open source. Plus, you know, there's ways you can use open source and then still isolate it in a way that you can wrap differentiate around it. When you pass it back to the community, like Simon was talking about, where it actually now is open source yourself, yes, you can't have any differentiation there because everybody is then on that same footing. But, I mean, that's ultimately as a vendor where you have to make trade-offs. Oh, well, I, yeah, that's, um, that's a good question for a start, a, a, a good answer there. I think also that, uh, you know, you differentiate in the way that people who deliver open source solutions today differentiate. You, right? you differentiate an ability to support that product. Right? Yeah. Let's, say, let's say, for example, we open sourced our, our, our software-based SBC, right? and everybody started using it. Well... Uh, we could start a business whereas we provided support for that, uh, for, for, that, uh, for that software, much in the way Red Hat does uh, with true. Linux today. Right? So, uh, uh, you know, you're not providing differentiation necessarily in the, in the normal way. You're, you're recreating the way a vendor like us makes money. I mean, we're not, perhaps, not looking to make money out of the software in the way we've done the, in the past. You know, in the way a vendor like us may survive is to, you know, Again, do what Red Hat uh, did, which was change their model completely and say, you know what, we're in the business of supporting the software. That's what we do. You know, that could be providing a hardened product. That could be providing uh, fast turnaround for bug fixes, 24-hour turnaround for bug fixes, for example. It could be saying, you know, I'm going to add special features and functionality in the platform for an individual customer. Lots of ways you can differentiate, even though it's the same software base. Any other audience questions? I have a quick question I'll ask. Um, how can telcos take advantage of the open source trend to compete with over the top providers? Kevin? Good question. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pieces that you can actually, as a telco now, you can actually take components and cobble together solutions that are very similar to the over top things. You know, whether a telco would want to do that's a different story, right? Because it's just going to be effectively the same as what you would get from a over-the-top provider, but telco branded, which is not going to provide you any real differentiation. So you're, you know, to some, back to Simon's point of, you know, you're going to have differentiation through how you support it, et cetera. The telco could take those different pieces, put it into a solution, and then actually, you know, market it as a per dollar per month charge on a different solution. So, you know, provide the support versus the, you know, ultimately how you can get into the market better with support than with a product sometimes. Simon, did you want to comment? Yeah, I'll probably add to that a little bit. And again, I'll go back to, uh, to, to, to Project Clearwater here to a, to a certain extent. Of course, um, we do have, a, for example, an app server element of Project Clearwater that we open sourced. Uh, it's an IR92 compliant app server. You deliver a, you know, 15 or so sub-services. You need to deliver a, a Volte service using, using, that, uh, using the app server. So you add that and put our, the other IMS core components of, uh, of Clearwater in there. And a carrier could deliver a voice service with open source. And indeed, they could definitely do it. Um, it's so, I mean, that's the way to compete with, uh, uh, with, with over the top voice providers. I mean, it's free. Right? And again, you might pay a little bit for support if you want to, but essentially uh, it, it, it's a free service, free offering. That's how they compete. Now, interestingly enough, um, when we first started showing Clearwater in its original instance, you know, some of the old style telco guys came to us and said, yeah, this is brilliant, this is great, you're delivering uh, for free, blah, blah. Okay, so where's the billing interfaces then? <laughs> and our first response was, billing? Yeah, you're going to, you're billing for this stuff? I mean, it's voice? Isn't voice sort of becoming free? Now, maybe a little bit ahead of myself there, of course, because, you know, uh, we know there's a, there, is a, there is a need for billing ultimately, and we're uh, adding diameter ROIF interfaces in there for that, for that purpose. But you, you get my point here. Again, if you want to compete, you can do it with something like uh, Project Clear or whatever, a very, very, very low cost. But you know, don't forget some of those other models are going out the window now as well, like the ability to charge per minute for a voice service. Great. Uh, any other audience questions? 
Okay, well, thank you very much to our uh, panelists. Thank you for attending. And again, I just want to remind you, uh, uh, we urge you to uh, go and take a look at uh, the tables across the hall and to fill out uh, the speaker input forms. Thanks again.